the Movies of the Meek, where we watch made-for-TV movies and miniseries so you don't have to. From Gia to Xenon, Hysteria to Sybil, welcome to Movies of the Meek. Alright, Sales Lot is a 1979 adaptation of um, Stephen, King, Stephen King's second novel. Uh, it's about a writer who returns to his hometown uh, and quickly realizes that the town is overrun by vampires. Um, this, so this movie starts at the end, technically, right? Starts uh, yeah when they're in, or were they in Mexico or where are they? Guatemala? Yeah, they're in Mexico. Yeah. Um, and they're, like, filling up their holy water jars. And they realize that, uh, I guess, I don't know if this is, like, a traditional vampire thing, but the holy water glows when the vampires are close. <laughs> I don't know. I kept asking, like, <laughs> I kept asking Tommy, <laughs> like, is this, like, a vampire thing? Um, uh, but they realize that they're that the vampires are are fairly close uh at this point we start the movie um yeah so (laughs) the main character is hutch from starsky and hutch yeah yeah aka ben yeah ben mears for his sake he's a writer um and like he gets to town and like the first hour and a half of this movie is just him kind of like hanging out and like realizing things are a little fucking weird and we like yeah and there's so many characters we get introduced to like i don't know 15 people or something it does it all pretty quick yeah i mean it does but we like we follow these people around for a while and and some yeah. characters like don't even appear in the second half of the movie um yeah and like have no bearing on like the central vampire plot at all. It's just kind of like yeah, which <laughs> <laughs> is fine. It's all good. I mean, they're 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 more they're more there just to like get the vampire there. You know, yeah, that was like specifically. I'm talking about Cauley and his wife. Yeah, like he was yeah. the. So let's maybe we should like back up a little bit. Um so Ben gets to town, and he instantly goes to the house. <laughs> he, yeah. So, I mean, it's brought up that he's he's been drawn to this house since he was a kid, and then yeah, for whatever reason, now is the time that he he decided to, to go back, and he wants to write a story. His next novel wants um, is going to be on this house, this haunted house in Sa- uh, in Salem, and and. Um, he actually goes to the realtor and tries to buy it, which I thought was strange that he gets to town and immediately yeah. wants to buy this house, I guess, to write the book yeah. in there instead of just, like, renting it. Um, the house is falling apart, by the way. It's, like, completely... <laughs> it's completely decaying. Uh, but it turns out that it was just purchased by the... by another, um, like, new resident of the town, which is uh, Straker. Uh, yeah, and he he just purchased the house, and he is like, uh, well, we th- he's like an antique dealer, I guess, or that's his cover story. Yeah. Um. So, Ben finds, I guess he does. Where is he? Like a boarding house or something? He just like, he rents a room somewhere, with like yeah, the, he just goes with like to that lady the best view of the of the mansion and the whole town. <laughs> like, so 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 information about that mansion and also some questions about that mansion is uh so (laughs) my my question is does where that mansion is really matter because i was listening to the director's commentary and toby hooper talks about how it's like incredibly important like where this mansion is positioned and how like they knew exactly where it should be and they they saw this top of this hill that hill that looked over the town and they were like that's where the mansion should be fuck there's a house there and so they built the mansion around a pre-existing house really and so the entire production there were actually people living inside a house that was inside the mansion wow that's pretty cool and 
and, and but my my question is like you never see a like a pan from the house to the town no like you there's a few shots facing the town like on the yeah, porch of the mansion but yeah you never yeah but but it's never it's never a shot that's like from like a window of the house looking onto the town or like it's it's never a shot where you can see both the house and the town so it seems like it makes no sense to like build that house there it kind of just seems like you're doing that for no reason i was going to save this for the trivia but they spent a hundred thousand dollars making the front of the house <laughs> <laughs> so i guess building the fake house in front of the real house <laughs> around it it covered oh, every oh, wall oh oh man and they spent yeah. like another 70k on the interior shots Ugh. which is a lot of money but, in 1970 but but it just seems like completely pointless to like like you could have shots of him going up to that hill and then he looks at the house and then have a shot of a house that you want it to look like yeah I guess you, you know, know you didn't need to build over a house <laughs> <laughs> or, or or like build it in a specific place i don't know <laughs> it's and also for for how lazy i found out this movie is like this movie takes place in maine like of course every stephen king <laughs> thing does um but it, it the actual shooting locations were all just in northern california and uh, when they go to Mexico at the end of the movie, uh, the church that they're in is actually just a church in Los Angeles. <laughs> Wait, what? Yeah, the guy, Toby Hooper is just like, yeah, I mean, if I remember correctly, like, we just, like, found a church in L.A. and we were like, this looks good enough. <laughs> And so it's like it's so weird that like that's the thing that they were nitpicky about. It's like they saw a hill and they were like, "That's that's that's where it should be." In the I don't that's know, real important. Like in the book, was it on a hill like that? Was that an iconic image from the book? I I mean it, it's it's honestly he he and he also talks about this like, of course everyone wants to be like Psycho, but no one wants to directly rip off Psycho. And so it, it's he talks about how they wanted to design they want to design this house this way, but they didn't want to directly rip off Psycho. And this is also the same year that Amityville Horror came out. Um, A lot of and, house and, horror. And, and so yeah, so it's like it's it. There's a very clear aesthetic that they're establishing, um, and so I guess. You know, just because it's it's very reminiscent of the Psycho House. How does it compare to just, the? They're just trying to the Texas Chainsaw like Massacre House. Uh, yeah, diff very different. Oh, very different. <laughs> yeah, that was also a scary house. Um, but I, but I I just thought that was an incredibly strange choice to go through all that time and effort. You no, know, I agree. For, and the money uh, spent on it. Yeah, I mean it's it's really strange. You could literally just just cut just cut the way you normally do in this film. <laughs> like there there are no shots that actually make that unnecessary change and choice. But that's fine. <laughs> it's a hundred thousand dollars. Just do whatever. Um, <laughs> but yeah. And so after after seeing the house, he does go and rent a place. And, you know, it's it's when he's going to rent the place that he leaves. And then we have the establishing between uh, my boy Fred Willard and uh, Bonnie, uh, who ends up wearing a very scantily clad uh, sort of like rollerblading girl outfit later. Um, and, you know, she's calling him honey and stuff like that. See you tonight, honey. Um, and, you know, so you get these inklings of these relationships uh uh ben also drives by my boy mark uh who of course he is seen with much later on in the movie uh their their plots become intertwined wonderfully <laughs> um and then he ends up wandering through a park and he sees his own book and so he has to go be a dick yeah. and walk up to the girl who's reading his own book and uh she's like 
is that you? And then he's like, you should not treat my book like a piece of shit. <laughs> um, and she's like, it is you. And he's like, yeah, it's me. Did you even fucking read it? And she's like, oh, she's like, no. no, I was reading this other book. And he's like, well, you don't even have to. It's fine. Do you want to get dinner? <laughs> and she says, yeah, but they go to have dinner at her parents' house? Yeah, and her father, what does her father do for the town? Because he's an important person, I feel like. I don't know. He, he, he uh, what, he's a, like an attorney or something? Yeah, I don't, like, it's, it implies that he has, like, a little bit of power in the town. Like, I, I don't know. He's a somebody. Yeah. Um, yeah, they have dinner at... <laughs> with the parents like that's that's where you go for dinner <laughs> like yeah, they, they, they don't go out. on their first date until like two hours into the movie yeah <laughs> um but that it's all... that gets them all in the same room though so i guess that's why yeah and and of course you know they get to talk about the woman that he's renting a room from and how the dad was like back in the day she used to be hot as fuck <laughs> she's not she's anymore. like She's not anymore, but you really got to talk about that. And then uh, the dad's like, what kind of books does he write? And she's like, he writes books about, you know, gay boys. And he's like, ew, gay boys. (laughs) Yeah, so that was his last book was... (laughs) Air Dancer. Was called Air Dancer, and then his next, his follow-up is a haunted, a haunted house book. (laughs) Do you think okay? So, I have a theory about this. Um, so the the memory that he has about the haunted house is about a boy that he thought he saw dead there, hanging from the ceiling. And the the idea is that basically, like he's had these these memories, and uh, they've been getting stronger and coming back. And so, do you think that it's supposed to be like? Uh, uh, like a repressed memory and so the idea is that like he's been hiding it for so long and now he's finally willing to reveal that he he has these thoughts and these feelings and so that's how it's continuing with his thematic themes absolutely it's it's like the i it, it, like he's 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 using horror as as a guise to write about uh being a closeted homosexual and finally being able to reveal himself um Yes, that sounds answer. that sounds plausible, I guess. <laughs> is that true? Did you look that up? Is that something like Stephen King said? <laughs> what? No. <laughs> um, but, but, uh, but, but yeah, so he really wants to write this book. Uh, their romance is really weird. Um, his and Susan's. And it reminds me of like two 13-year-olds. Um. <laughs> And it's really bizarre, because, like, after they have dinner, then she's like, you want to go over by the creek, or do you want to go? And it's like, he has a hotel room, like, who are you? Like, Like, what? (laughs) Yeah, it was a little weird, man. It's so weird. It was, I mean, mean, their romance is kind of, I don't know. It... I, I don't I don't know man I mean I think I mean this movie was made in the seventies maybe but I don't like I mean that's how people dated back then man maybe they just kind of hung out went to the creek had dinner with their parents I mean y- y- like it is a small town and everything but it's like you could still still be adults, adults <laughs> you know I mean I don't know you could have gone to a restaurant. Yeah, this the is... town has restaurants. We see them two I mean, hours later. Yeah, and he goes to the restaurant multiple times. Oh yeah, with many people. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like he has like he has like dinner with everyone in this movie. Because <laughs> that's what you gotta spend time on. <laughs> that's how he shares um, all his juicy details about the vampires with people. He takes them out to yeah. dinner. <laughs> um, but yeah, so this beautiful relationship is 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 happening and then um while this is happening we also get introduced to uh straker and him just being a weird as fuck yeah. dude he's yeah. just like 
fucking getting his antiques yeah, and like the, and like so ben finds out that shrieker bought that house like very early on in the movie and i feel like he visits the house like, he drives up to the house a couple times and like shrieker's just like chilling like, there's a couple of times he's just like looking at him he's <laughs> he's just being just a weird dude but i just found it weird that yeah. ben like kept going to the house i don't know what he was looking for he was just kind of hanging out, being weird, uh, and trespassing. Um, inspiration. Inspiration for his book. But he had, like, a good yeah. view of the house from his hotel room, so I don't know. He's even, like, <laughs> is there, is there, let's see, he has, like, binoculars that he's just, like, <laughs> he's just creeping on Straker. Um, but, yeah. uh. One time he goes there, like, really late at night, um, and, uh. Like, like Striker just like appears behind him, and it like scares the shit out of him. And then he just like stares at him, and then he walks away with his cane. The lighting for that scene is like really amazing. Yeah, there's a lot of scenes in this movie that are fucking awesome. Just like really beautiful, and like the score is amazing. Score is so good. It's about an hour. I want to maybe a little less of of us just kind of hanging, you know, uh, seeing the relationship between Ben and, and Susan. We get some weird Straker, and then um, Straker starts to make plans to get uh, the Master Vampire into Salem. Yes. yes. And this involves, um, this involves Kali, who I guess who is, like, the town's, like, mover or something. <laughs> He's a truck driver, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. So, 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 so what happens is that it's, uh, so Stryker hires Fred Willard's character to move everything. Oh, oh yeah, and that's it. So Fred Willard hires Cully to do it because Fred Willard is boning Cully's wife. And so he just wants another time for Cully to be out of town. And so he just is like, hey, Cully, I need you, I need two guys to move this thing, and you're going to get paid handsomely. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink, leave your fucking house. Uh, and so that's what basically happens. And so Cully arranges for a bunch of people to get all the stuff so that he can catch Fred Willard with his wife. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. And which is probably like my favorite scene in the whole movie is oh yeah so he pays them to pick up the crate in portland which they do and then collie stays behind and like downs a six pack <laughs> and like just waits for uh for uh fred willard to get to his to his house and of course he does and uh <laughs> so yeah collie catches him uh you know making out and then he goes and he's just like a goofy dude like i don't know i wasn't expecting his character like i know he was drunk but i wasn't expecting him to like fucking grab a shotgun out of the garage <laughs> and then he yeah. he goes in um he catches him in the bedroom and then he pulls out like he he gets fred willard to come out in the living room and he like what does he do he like holds his shotgun to his face Makes him grab he, the barrel and then like yeah he, he makes him grab the barrel and put it up to his face and then he tells him to close his eyes. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that that's that that entire sequence is like the most like terrifying sequence of this entire movie in my opinion. Like, I was never more tense than I was during that scene. Yeah, same. I, I mean, I thought he was gonna kill him. Like, yeah. Um, and then he, <laughs> of course, the gun wasn't loaded, but like, but and then I mean, I thought this was a pretty fucked up moment. And then he doesn't. He just scares Fred Willard, and and he leaves. And then he goes in the bedroom, and then just proceeds to beat his wife. Yeah, which and is, that's the end of their story. Yeah, and that's like another thing that I don't. I mean. Domestic violence is portrayed in, in like movies nowadays too. I mean, I don't know, um, but like, this was like a TV movie, and it was and it was a little like disturbing. I don't know, and then you actually yeah. see them one other time, 
I think I don't know what they're doing. They're in like the truck, him and his wife, and she's got a big ass bruise across her face. Um, but yeah, you're, like you said, you don't see him again in the movie. <laughs> yeah, it's it's crazy. You see Fred Willer way more. Yeah, yeah, and like I don't know. I was expecting them to come back and be turned at one point or another. Yeah. You got a psycho vampire collie with a shotgun. But, uh, no, that's it. I thought that was weird. But they're, I think that's, like, the only um, plot line that we don't get a true, like, conclusion to. I think all the other characters yeah, it, it, yeah. have it, some it, sort of closure. Just, <laughs> I guess, Collie's their closure was that he beats his wife, and that's, it, and that's the way it is, <laughs> I guess. Um... <laughs> <laughs> just another day in Salem's lot <laughs> which is like pretty um, tame for Stephen King cause he I don't know he puts some crazy shit in his books yeah um but but yeah man dude that that confrontation scene where he sees both of them on the bed like she's in the sexy blue outfit and Fred Willard is in his, his sexy red shorts um and I mean those are some nice shorts I'll be honest yeah some sad um I, I, yeah, I dig, I dug those like hard. Um, and then, you know, she, she instantly is like, he was raping me. And Fred Willard's like, what? What? <laughs> and he's like, oh, is that what it is? You're a rapist. And like, he knows. And, and he just like, ugh, that whole scene. Ugh. It felt like it was out of a different so movie. So intense. Oh, yeah. It, it made it, zero sense. Yeah, and and they're 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 juxtapositioning it with the two guys in the package, and they're like, "Oh, this package real cold. Oh man, uh, we should check out what's inside of this ch- package. It's real cold." Yeah, it's like yeah, and then it cuts to like, like, <laughs> like him beating his wife is insane. Yeah, I guess they had to lighten the mood a little bit. Yeah, well, and and and, and <laughs> like. <laughs> You know, it it, it 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 shows like him him pretending to blow Fred Willard's brains out, and and he then goes into a room where he he proceeds to beat his wife and then shut the door, and then we cut back to uh the guys did a bad job putting that box in the basement, and so the entire box has exploded, and and the contents have exploded out of the inside of this box. Ugh. <laughs> yeah, what was that about? Why did it? Why did uh, it so when Stryker is giving Fred Willard a list of things that he needs to have happen with the box, he's like, "I need them to make sure I carry it, and then here you, you need four padlocks with four separate keys, and you need to put one on each side and lock it together as securely as possible." And so then when they put the box in the basement. Uh, they're freaked out by it because there's just like wind coming from everywhere <laughs> um, and they're like what's this wind why is the box cold what's going on this basement's weird and so the guy just throws the pile of locks and chains down in the basement so he didn't chain the box up like he was supposed to and so the end result is because they were haphazardly putting the box down in the basement. Uh, it also, just how did they get explodes. that box into the basement? That's a great question. Because it's really fu- like they barely got onto the truck and that has a lift. And to think these two guys carried it into the like down cellar steps yeah. is insane. Yeah, but and, and the box is like too big for those doors. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't know, whatever. Um, but this is where the movie like really picks up because after they drop the box off, then um, Mr. Barlow, <laughs> the master vampire, <laughs> like his name is Mr. Barlow, <laughs> my master. <laughs> um, um. Well, no. So he doesn't. He doesn't attack first, right? Um, Straker. So there's like so many fucking characters in this movie. Um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Mark. His two friends, the the Gleek brothers, whatever they're called, Ralphie and Danny, whatever. Um, yeah. They they're like returning home or something, and they're in the woods. They they cut through the woods, I guess near the yep. Marston house, and Straker kidnaps Ralphie. 
Yeah. Yeah. And and that's like I guess that's um for that's for um Barlow as like his first meal I guess to get his drink yeah. back. Um. And then this is when everyone starts turning. It's like a domino effect. And Ralphie. Yeah. Turns his yeah. brother Danny, and then Danny. Do they tries to turn Mark? Yeah, but doesn't Dan? They turn their parents, right? Or is that what happens? Yeah. 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 They turn their parents. He tries, and then Danny tries to turn Mark. And what? So they do this scene like three times where the floating kid in the window. Yeah. Which which was like super effective, but at like the fourth or third or fourth time, I was like, this is not as like creepy anymore. <laughs> You know, like it was really effective the first time, and and that's I'll say the the makeup for all of that is great. Yeah, super creepy, like cat like um, eyes. Them them using like they they use like a a a, a like a crane instead of using wires to yeah, move the kids I was wondering, around. Yeah, I looked it up because they he like gets pushed through the window. He like floats yeah. through the window. It's pretty cool. And then they have like weird like fog effects. Like they looks like they're um, I don't know what they're doing, but like the fall keeps like, like sucking in and out of the the kid's body is really strange. Yeah, and so it's shot in reverse. Um, and 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 so that's that's they they basically they start with like a whole shit ton of fog, like basically and. and like they just like <laughs> they start with like the impact shot and it's like pouring fog on the two of them and then they reverse the shot so that like as it continues like this amount of fog starts building towards a climax but my my thing with all of the vampire sequences is that it's like modern vampire attacks in movies are like so aggressive that these are kind of like they're all really slow. Yeah. Like they kind of just like it's like he opens his mouth and he's like Aah. and then he bites in slowly. He doesn't even bite him. Like the kid doesn't even uh Ralphie doesn't even bite Danny. It like cuts it before it even even does anything. He, when like the first ad- adult that he attacks, he bites them. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. it's so slow. And like when 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 Barlow attacks Susan's ex in the prison, it's so slow, and and so that's 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 my my main complaint for that stuff is that it's like it it doesn't have for as aggressive the the imagery of these characters is like it's not it's not followed up by actual for like, as aggressive as things. that fucking shotgun scene was, nothing matches up to that. Oh yeah, yeah. And there's a few like good jump scares, but um. Anytime a vampire is biting someone, it's like, it's pretty slow. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> Ben, I mean, Mark, um, since he's like a theater geek and he likes horror, he knows how to repel vampires. So he repels Danny. Yeah. And then, what happens to Dan? Does Danny go and bite the groundskeeper? Yes. Yeah, it turns him. Yeah, be, be, because so uh, they they bury him, and as they're burying him, like uh, everyone leaves, and it's just the groundskeeper and him and the corpse, and then he's about to bury him, but then of course he hears the siren song calling him from the grave, and so he just falls in, and then just pulls that casket open, and then boom, he's a vampire. Well, not quite. He's like kind of sick yeah. for a couple of days. And then, like, the symptoms are just, like, they have a cold. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then they turn into a vampire. It, it, it's, it's, it's also interesting how, like, when they're a vampire, they then have, like, a period of time where they're normal afterwards. And they're like, I had the strangest dream. <laughs> And it's like, yeah, you, you were a vampire. That wasn't a dream. And they're just like, they're like, what? No, I had like a real weird dream, guys. <laughs> Ugh. So like, <sighs> he. I'm sorry. This movie was so fucking long. It was three <laughs> hours long. 
They so <clears throat> most of the town gets turned at this point. Yeah. Mark Mark um teams up with uh Ben They go into Do they go into the house twice or just once? I th- so like I remember it, Susan so, so. Susan and and Mark go to that well Mark goes to the house um well, let's first let's say that the Barlow kills um, Mark's parents. Yeah, that's his that's his drive to go to go kill Barlow uh, at the Marston house, and then yeah. Susan follows him in. Yeah, she was supposed to leave, wasn't she? Yeah, yeah, she's a dummy. <laughs> and then Ben follows them in with with her dad, with Susan's dad. Is that what he does? Yeah. He teams yep. up with Susan's dad, and they follow him in. Uh, is there anything else I'm missing before we get to this, this part? I mean, yeah, but what, whatever. This movie's so long. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's funny because this movie was supposed to be a theatrical movie, but they thought they couldn't make it work in that form in that time limit. So yeah. But like, I think it would have done some good to cut out, like some of the plot lines, maybe, <laughs> like Kali, like all that stuff. Anyway. Um, they get to the house, which, I mean, I think is like the coolest set design in the whole movie. Oh, yeah. Definitely looks like it's $70,000 worth. Um, and so this is my biggest question in the movie. So, uh, Susan's dad is, he goes in and, I mean, it's like the most, like the most gore we see in the whole movie too. He... He confronts Straker. Now, yeah. up until this point in the movie, I thought Straker was just a dude, right? He's just a servant of Barlow. Same. He's a human. Yeah. From what I can tell. That's what I thought too. Yeah. But he picks, um, Susan's dad up like he was like, a feather. Yeah. Like picks him right up by the shoulders and then like walks him into a wall of antlers and impales him. Yeah. That was super gory, wasn't it? That part was fucking awesome. Yeah, it was rad. But then I was like, wait, is he a vampire too? Yeah. But he's not, and because immediately he gets shot down by uh, Mark. So, yeah. Or Ben, I mean, sorry. Um, so what was he? <laughs> like, was he just, and, was he incredibly strong because he's, like, in the vicinity of Barlow or something? Like, I don't know. Yeah, and, and so that's something that, like, the book does more of. Which is, it, it, it's kind of strange because, you know, so the, the idea is, and, and they kind of, they hint, they hint to it in dialogue with, uh, like, uh, there's the whole plot where, like, Ben goes and he meets with his old English teacher, and, and, and he's like, he's like, you're, you're the one that got me to write, you're the one that made me who I am, like, you're the king, you're the best, and then the English teacher is like, well, there's another guy who also will be the best, Mark, Mark is the best, Mark is great, Mark is just like you, you know, it's all about finding this real talent, and, you know, just making sure that it continues moving forward, um, and you know he he goes through his whole thing where he's talking about the house and all the fucking crazy shit about the house and then he was like i believe that an evil house attracts evil men and then uh the the teacher is like well if an evil house attracts evil men uh he goes then why did it attract me and and one of the things that they they definitely talk more about in the book is just the idea that it's like this evil presence is changing this town you know and so it, it's not only that there is a vampire that's changing people but also like it's affecting the whole town and the whole mentality of the town and, and so it, it's not only like there's the literal people being transformed into vampires but there's also just like there is a manifestation of evil and it's tainting everyone um, which once again isn't really that's a hard thing to do in a movie <laughs> and it, it's a hard thing to do when and I will say like I give the film kudos for like not really showing the the monster until like the last 20 minutes um, but but that's definitely it is it is a difficult thing to do to to have something that like 
is an evil presence and 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 let the viewer know that it is affecting people when you don't see it mm. yeah but they tried they did try. um <laughs> it was <laughs> i just it was a little shocking that part. yeah and, and 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 so that's the thing is that it's like you know you you think that that striker is is a regular human you know, but the idea is that he's been tainted by this evil. He wanted this evil to come there, and he brought it there. And so he is being bestowed, like, these gifts because of it. That makes sense. Well, he is very quickly gunned down, so... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess it, was, it was just the incredible strength. <laughs> um... But yeah, I mean, I absolutely like the impaling on the horns was absolutely amazing. That was rad. You know, and then they you basically have like your fucking let's finish this sequence where they're like, let's go down, we're going to the crypt, we're going to find him. Uh, and I laughed that entire scene. Really? I laughed the entire time because there is so much shit that happens in that that is just hilarious. Uh, like... Uh, when when Ben and Mark go up to uh, the master, aka Nosferatu, um, when they go up to his crypt, and uh, the master opens his eyes, and Mark goes and he starts staring into his eyes. Ben just shoves Mark, and he slams yeah. into a table. <laughs> like I could not stop laughing after that point because I was like, Jesus, calm the <laughs> yeah, fuck you down. Like, like throws me across the room. <laughs> And then, and then after that, like, like the master's head like bobs up like so comically. <laughs> um, His whole death the, the, was pretty funny. The the teeth of the master are silver, which all I could think of was like uh, the movie Alien. How you can clearly tell, like in the chestburster scene, that it's a mechanical head because the teeth are metal. Like it, it, it reminded me of that. Like the entire climax climax of this movie, I was just laughing the entire time. Like I loved it. I had a great time with it, but I was just laughing constantly. Like. Ugh, so good. Um, I like the uh, the effect of it, like the rotting skull. Of yeah, that was good. That was pretty sick. Um, and and you know, then they light the house on fire. Yeah, which so all those vampires were still in the crypt, right? Because they're like all the yeah. most of the vampires they turned were hanging out in the little vampire den. Yeah, um, including like the Glick boys and 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 stuff. So they and all got Susan. Yes, yeah, and they all got burnt down, right? Like they all died. No, and and so that's the thing is that like they're they're burning the house because the remnants of Barlow are in there, um, but they don't know obviously what like burning them will do, and so that's why they're like later on the car they're like we're gonna run because they will come for us. Yeah, that's I I guess I mean. I thought there was other vampires that were in the house, but I guess burning them does doesn't do anything or kill some of them. Um, I like we know Susan is still alive at yeah. the end, but it also implies that, like the other ones are alive. I'm, uh, it's possible that she turned some as well. And, yeah, it's like, like was it two years or a few years after? Yeah, it's two years yeah. after, and like possibly like Mark's parents are vampires still. You know. Yeah. Yeah, but um, but yeah, they they burn down the house, and then it goes, it cuts back to where we found them at the beginning of the movie, and Susan, well, they see that the the holy water glows, so they know they're <laughs> close because that's the sign, and then they go back to their where they're staying, and Susan is waiting for for Ben, and she is a vampire. Yeah, and she almost bites him, but because it takes like forty-five minutes for them to bite the humans, <laughs> he has enough time to kill her, uh, and then they leave. Yeah, it looks like they didn't like take a shower in two years either. Oh yeah, they, they are they're, brown. They're in Mexico, so they I guess they were, <laughs> it's dirty there. Like I don't know why they're so fucking dirty. Yeah. Um, and that's it. That's the movie. All right. 
Well, let's do some trivias and goofs. <laughs> okay. uh, this trivia just talks about how Stephen King sets a lot of his stories in small towns in Maine <laughs> specifically. <laughs> like the lot of similarities to it, and just like yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and like it also talks about um, how the main character is a writer. Stephen King likes to write about writers. Yeah. Um, let's see. I already talked about the budget for the house, right? Yeah, the outside yeah. was $100,000 to build around the existing house. I didn't know about the existing house. <laughs> that part's crazy. That's, dude, fucking, that's crazy. And then the interior <laughs> was seventy grand. Um, And the score was nominated for an Emmy. And then what it lose to again? High Midnight Shit. Hold on. High, yeah, it was something like that. It is high midnight. Okay. Um, all right, and then some goofs. Um, while a vampire, Ralphie is in his pajamas, although he died in his <laughs> regular clothing. I, I noticed that. Like, did he turn and then put on his pajamas? Uh, yes. <laughs> when they buried him, did they bury him in his pajamas? <laughs> <laughs> The answer is yes. <laughs> this is the last outfit you'll ever wear. Just some good old pajamas with a little nightcap. <laughs> um, all right, this is my favorite goof of all time. I'm going to read them back to back. All right, okay. so the first one is, uh, while having dinner with Jason, Ben tells him that he left Salem's Lot when he was 11 years old. Later, when <laughs> Deputy Gardner gives Constable Gillespie the FBI's findings on Ben, he states that Ben left Salem's Lot at the age of 10. All right, next goof. Yeah. And their initial dinner in the bar slash restaurant, <laughs> Ben tells Jason that he left Salem's Lot at the age of 10. Later, as Deputy Nolly relates the information he got about Ben's past from the FBI to Parkins, he states that Ben left the age at the age of 11. So they contradict each other. <laughs> also, I thought the dinner with Jason was at the house. Or was that at the restaurant? It's at the restaurant. Okay, so he's he's right there. Yeah. I just thought that was funny that you had two goofs <laughs> that were like <laughs> both giving uh, wrong information. Um, all right, Bonnie tells Larry that Collie would be in Portland before Collie is actually hired to go to Portland. <laughs> I I caught up on that one too. That was it's noticeable. Mm. But that's it for goofs. Um, all right, would you recommend this? I um. I would honestly. Yeah, me too. Like I, I, I did enjoy it thoroughly. Um, I yeah, would, like, I would break it up. I watched it in two sittings. It was a little, okay. It was a little slow. Um, did you watch it in one? Yeah. <laughs> nice. Um, next week we'll be watching Shadows of the Dead.